Kansas didn't make the final four, but they did make a final four of Riley Kugel in the quest to get better for next year. We deep dive on what Kugel can bring to the Jayhawks. You are locked on Jayhawks, your daily podcast on the Kansas Jayhawks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Derek Johnson. Give me a follow on Twitter at D Johnson Radio. Thanks for making Locked on Jayhawks your first listen every day. We are free and available anywhere you get your podcast. And you can find us on our YouTube page where you can like and subscribe to the show. Certainly, if you could, it helps us out on our end of things. On today's edition of Locked on Jayhawks, we're talking Riley Kugel, who is a transfer portal player from Florida. Highly touted player in terms of having some uh, interesting pass production. Put a final four out there already and Kansas is in the list. So we're going to get to our first player off season deep dive for this off season before we get into any of that and the info on Riley Kugel, how he would fit with KU and also a little KU women's basketball news too. This episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out today at NissanUSA.com. So Riley Kugel, who is Riley Kugel? Well, first of all, uh, he is a guard wing, whatever you want to call him, transfer from Florida. And he posted this on his Twitter earlier on Thursday saying, quote, excited to announce the four schools that I've decided to focus my attention on during my transfer process. I'm appreciative of other schools who considered me for their program. And then it was a graphic with a picture of him And it said Final Four, and it said Arizona, UConn, Kansas, and Houston. So that's a pretty powerful list of four teams. Also notice he said focus my attention on during the transfer process. Uh, I'd imagine that's not something where it's like, okay, he – You know, it's probably going to take some time. Uh, UConn is still in the NCAA tournament. You know, Houston's still in the NCAA tournament. Arizona just lost yesterday. Probably going to take some time to set up some visits and go through everything you want to go through. So I don't think this is going to be like an immediate thing next week. Maybe Kansas does have an advantage because those others are in the tournament, except for Arizona who just lost. And um, maybe they can get a quick visit and – Get it done on the visit. I don't know. But he's a six foot five, 207 pound guard slash wing. He was actually listed as a shooting guard in high school. Um, he's also listed as like a point guard on his transfer page on 24 7 sports. I view him more as like a two three man. Uh, he even played the wing and the three and, and even a little bit of four ball as a freshman of Florida. This year he was like a two and a three. And he came in from high school as the number 56 overall recruit and the number four shooting guard on 24-7 sports rankings when he was a freshman, not this past season, but the year before at Florida. So I actually did a wing offseason target preview for Kansas yesterday. And obviously that's a list that's constantly getting you know added to. I actually didn't have Riley Kugel on that list. And let me explain why. Um, he lost a little bit of favor with his coach at Florida, Todd Golden, and didn't seem to take it all that well coming off the bench. I mean, in talking to people who covered Florida and in listening to some like NBA draft uh, podcasts that kind of talk about this stuff, they said he didn't really handle it well, which tells me that at the time when I was putting together a list, I was like, well, if you're bringing him on, you better be darn certain that he's a starter because I don't know how he's like, if, if he didn't handle coming off the bench well, which a lot of guys don't, that basically means wherever he transfers to, he's not going to want to come off the bench, which means it's a very peculiar or a very particular fit, I think would be the better way of saying it, for Kansas. doesn't mean it's a bad thing or, or it would be a bad fit or that Kansas shouldn't want him. It's just that when I viewed it as, okay, well, hypothetically, if you bring KJ and Hunter back and you have Dewan Harris back, and what if Furphy comes back? Uh, then at that point, you only have one starting spot left. Are you ready to guarantee it this early in the portal? So I didn't have him on there. I think from a pure talent wise, he, he and now that we know Kansas is interested and he's interested in Kansas to a certain extent, um, I put him on my tier two. So if you remember, my tier one guys are like immediate starters and all league level guys. Tier two guys are they're probably going to start. Um, but it's, you know, they're not necessarily expected to be like all big 12 first team or anything like that. Now, the funny part of this is if Riley Kugel would have transferred after his freshman season at Florida, he would have been a tier one guy wherever he would have ended up. He would have been thought of as, yeah, he's going to be 
you know, this all league player for you and he's going to be a starter. Now I think you bring him on and you expect him to be a starter. But his freshman year was that 2022 to 2023 season. That saw him earn all SEC freshman team. He averaged about 10 points, three rebounds per game on 45.6% from the floor, 37.6% from three. So very good efficiency on both of those. And those numbers went up in SEC play. He finished the season strong. He averaged 12.6 points per game in SEC games. That was most by a Florida freshman since Bradley Beal. And then in just the month of February and March, so February on over 12 games, he finished the year averaging 15.3 points per game. So he finished on a, a high note where it was like, oh, he's a freshman, finished on a high note. Uh, he wound up in the 77th percentile for pick and roll ball handling efficiency, according to Synergy, 57th in spot up shooting, so still above average there, 82nd percentile in jump shots, including 82nd percentile in catch and shoot opportunities and 86th percentile in guarded catch and shoot opportunities and 86th percentile in dribble jumpers. This is a guy who could take tough shots. He would make tough shots and he had a lot of different ways that he could score the basketball. And so much so that he was kind of a 2024 early NBA draft darling, like a guy who, you know, every year there's the players like um, a Ochag Baji a couple of years ago where it's like, yeah, maybe he's going to be like an early second round pick. And he just emerges the next year in college basketball. And now he's a first round pick. Now he's like, you know, a lottery pick or borderline lottery pick. And there were a lot of people suggesting that maybe that would be Kugel this year, that after the way he finished his freshman season, he would carry that over in sophomore year. And then all of a sudden be like this first round pick or top 20 pick in the NBA draft this year. But things didn't click as much in year two. He shot under 40% from the field. He shot about 31% from three and his efficiency numbers, you know, took, took a dive. He dropped off from the being in the 77th percentile to 39th percentile in pick and roll. So that's a big difference there. You go from being good to below average. He dropped from 57th percentile above average in spot up shooting to this past year, 25th percentile in spot up shooting. So, you know, poor there. He went from 82nd percentile in jump shooting to 36th percentile in jump shooting this year. So, you know, the shooting kind of fell off, including a dip to 30th percentile in catch and shoot. We mentioned those was in the 80s and uh, 16th percentile in guarded jumpers after he was 86th the year before. The dribble jumpers actually stay solid 59th percentile, still above average, but that's also a big drop off from 86th percentile. So like all the efficiency dropped was it a mental thing uh, coming off the bench, being asked to do something else. You know, maybe you're not getting along with your coach and, and maybe it's a little bit harder to um, have the proper mentality going into it. I, I do think there was a little bit of, because when you look at the number of guarded jumpers that he took, it was about the same, the same percentage of his shots, uh, basically 47% of his shots both years were guarded jumpers. And that was about the same. So it wasn't just like his shot selection went way down. It was about the same. It's just one year he was making them in the 86th percentile. The other year he wasn't, you know, 59th percentile in dribble jumpers, 16th percentile in guarded jumpers, right? So one year he made them, one year he didn't. And it's almost like a, a big home run hitter who's going to strike out a ton in baseball. Like some years that home run hitter is going to hit 230 with 40 home runs, have a lot of strikeouts. And then there's going to be another year where, you know, you're talking about, I don't know, them hitting 200 and maybe they get demoted to triple A and, and then they, you know, only have 20 home runs or something like that or 25 home runs, right? Because it's too feast and famine. And maybe that's what it's like when you live on the margin like that, where, you know, you don't know if, um, or, or you don't know when you're taking that many contested shots, that many tough shots, it's going to be more fickle whether they're going in or not, right? But anyway, due to the struggles in Florida being better this year, they had more talented players. So other players they got to go to this year when he was struggling, where the coach is like, hey, we'll sit you down. He did get benched by Todd Golden about midway through the year. And he had some games where he looked pretty dejected off the bench. Uh, Game Theory podcast with Sam Vecini, who does great work for The Athletic. A few weeks ago on their podcast, the, they kind of called his some of his performances off the bench selfish. He hit a low point of playing three and six minutes in back-to-back -back games at one point. But even then, there's still the positives. Like, he dropped 25 points in a game against Baylor. He had 24 points in a game against Wake Forest, 22 in a game against Auburn. He had 11 points in the NCAA tournament, which is solid numbers off the bench against so I think to kind of sum it up, like this is a kid with a really high ceiling that fits your offensive needs. You need somebody who can create tough shots and make tough shots. And yeah, if they're always not the most efficient, like it is at least nice to have one of those guys in your roster 
Um, look at like Remy Martin, for instance, and his efficiency was a little bit better here, but he can also play as an off guard. He can play as a secondary ball handler. He can play as a wing. There's a lot of ways that this would fit for Kansas, but there are definite risks involved as well. Let's get into how exactly he would fit for KU on this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. This episode is brought to you by the spring cleaning champions, Manscaped. This season, make sure to groom your carpets and the drapes with the leaders in below the waist grooming. Clear out the winter bush with Manscaped's lawnmower 5.0 and watch your confidence bloom like the springtime flowers. Embrace the season and join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our special offer. Go to manscaped.com and use code locked on for 20% off plus free shipping. Introducing the Seasons Champ, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Their fifth generation trimmer features two interchangeable next-gen skin-safe blade heads, a standard one for taking a little off the top, and a new foil blade to go smooth wherever your heart desires. It also features dual LED spotlights to guide you through the darkest winter debris, navigate with confidence in your delicate areas, get 20% off and free shipping with code locked on at Manscaped. That is 20% off and free shipping with the code locked on at manscaped.com. Nothing like a little spring cleaning in your pants. We're also brought to you by Better Together. Bracket already busted. Tired of the same old daily fantasy grind where you make a roster, cross your fingers, hope for the best, or maybe you're losing on the last leg, your pick them entry. Introducing Better Together, the first cooperative daily fantasy platform where teamwork triumphs talent. And you can play with your friends, not against them. Pick more or less on real-time player stats, strategize with your partner to boost your odds, and climb the leaderboard together. So grab a friend and join the social DFS movement. Download Better Together now from the App Store and sign up using promo code Locked On for your chance to win a share of over $1,000 in cash prizes. Remember the code, Locked On, because winning alone is fun, but it's better together. So how would Riley Kugel fit with Kansas? You know, uh, one thing we didn't mention there in the rundown was the defense for Riley Kugel. And I do think that is important to bring up here. Um, it was described to me by Brandon Olson of Locked on Gators as a being kind of a gambler on the defensive end where he's going to go for steals and blocks. What times he's going to get them, but then at other times it's going to leave you in uncomfortable situations. And sometimes he gets too aggressive and fouls too much. Uh, especially in like double bonus situations where it led to a lot of unnecessary guys going to the line. And so overall on synergy, if we're looking to add the kind of analytic or, or the number approach into this, his freshman season, he was in the 35th percentile for defense on synergy. His sophomore season, he was in the 38th percentile. So I got tiny bit better, but both of those are below the national average. So I think kind of what you're expecting here is a below average defender that you hope with a year under Bill Self and, you know, wanting to bounce back here can get up to even average because what he can give you on the offensive end is going to overcome that. And when you have, you know, Dewan Harris to help be a kind of a countermate in the backcourt, like, you know, you do need more of an offensive guy. Well, as Dewan can be more of the defensive guy, um, you know, looking for somebody who gives you an offensive punch, which he did in, in year one. I mean, he still made tough shots in year two, but more efficiently in year one, he can create them. He didn't have a lot of creation of, you know, key moments and key situations this year. And maybe that is a perfect backcourt mate for Dewan Harris. You know what I mean? Where it's like Dewan is this low volume shooter who shoots high efficiency, at least from three. He obviously struggled on layups and everything. Um, is a good passer, is a good defender. Doesn't really take like bad shots. With Riley Kugel, sometimes you might view it as a bad shot, but he's going to make a lot of tough ones and bail you out of a lot of tough situations like late in shot clock or in a tough situation late in the game, um, but also maybe not as efficient, um, maybe not as good defensively, but maybe like the two of them morph together and that is kind of a perfect complement to each other. They're the yin to each other's yang, so to speak. And so I, I think also like when you're looking at this, if you do make a move like this, the beauty of Kugel is that you can – play him at the three you can play him at the two so like it doesn't stop you and what you want to do if you're bill self the rest of the offseason you bring on riley kugel and you know the next good player who just wants to come to your team is a wing 
you're like, okay, great. We can play Kugel at the two. We can play this wing at the three, you know, boom, we're good to go. And if Furphy comes back, we can play one of the wings at three, one of them at the four, you know, again, it all depends on the KJ and Hunter stuff, but uh, that's the point with Kugel. Or you can be like, oh, hey, look, there's this really good combo guard or this really good other point guard who wants to come here too. Okay, great. We'll play the really good uh, combo guard point guard next to Dwan Harris at the two and we'll play Riley Kugel at the three. And that is part of the beauty of this. I do think though, because Kugel uh, was not like a super high volume three-point shooter there either year and wasn't that efficient last year. It definitely makes it more important that the next edition you would make, whether it would be a, a two guard or a wing, definitely has to be more of a high volume, high efficiency three-point shooter. But still, it, it leaves you with a lot of options for what you want to do. Um, I think you can expect to see him start if he does come in, though, and I, I think, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I would almost view this as like Kansas bringing in their their two guard, even though it would open them up to kind of doing whatever. But, you know, I, I think the point being with Kugel, having some hiccups this year and having some questions about the efficiency and maybe the defense and how he handled things with Todd Golden and with Florida and everything and how much would Bill Self love some of those traits and love the gambling on defense and the shot selection. Maybe not quite as much, although I think the shot selection is less uh, prevalent for, if you're, you know, trying your butt on, on the defensive end, like I don't think he cares as much about that. anyway. Um, but this would be a high talent swing. This is a very talented basketball player that you hope hits and certainly would help fill some gaps in terms of being a scoring type option, a guy who can hit tough shots for you, a guy who can create tough shots for you. Those are things you need if you want to be in the national title discussion again. And it's not just going to come from one player, but this would be a start. And certainly the list of schools has to make you feel more comfortable because yes, I know you could easily point to like Nick Timberlake last year. His finalists were what? North Carolina, UConn, and Kansas. That's a great list too. And that didn't totally work out for Kansas, but Here's the thing. Not everything's going to work out and not everything's going to also be great. You know, like there's going to be some middle ground where things don't work out, where things do work out um, against the grain both ways. You can't preclude yourself when one bad situation happens from being like, oh, well, that prevents me from doing this ever again. You know, this guy has some questions. I'm never going to bring on a transfer who has some questions again. No, you have to continue to bank that you're going to be the one who adds a little bit more to their game and you're going to get the best out of them. And the best of Riley Kugel is a really good basketball player. And there are a lot of great coaches and a lot of great programs that are interested in Riley Kugel. And some of those other ones on that list, like UConn and uh, with Houston, with, you know, Kelvin Sampson, those are hard nosed basketball coaches. So if Riley Kugel, you know, if there was any bad blood with Todd Golden and stuff and, and that was part of the benching and maybe they didn't get along, who knows exactly what all went on there. You don't immediately go sign up for one of the, the biggest hard ass coaches with like Kelvin Sampson, who's going to coach you and make you grind it out. You know what I mean? So like, I think that is a little bit, I don't know, in a certain way, like it, it almost adds to the scouting report, like as a positive for, for what you're talking about here. Um, and so that makes me think that this kid can absolutely figure it out and get back to where he was. And it, honestly, if you're looking for a good comp in this situation, I don't think this is a good comp in terms of how both players play, because I think there are a lot of differences and, uh, I'm going to bring the name up now, Caleb love and love is more of kind of a point guard combo guard. Kugel, I again, view as more of like a two, three, there are a lot of differences in their game, but there are some similarities. Caleb love is somebody who. Uh, at times is going to make you like, oh, why did you take that shot? But he's going to make a lot of tough ones too. And I know Caleb Love, this is probably bad timing for this because he just had a really bad game in the Sweet 16 for Arizona where he went like four of 17 or four of 18 or something like that and kind of shot him a little bit out of the game. But guess what? Arizona was one of the best teams in the country this year and they made it to the second weekend. And yes, that was not a great game from Caleb Love. Um, but Caleb Love had some fit issues in North Carolina. He had that great year that helped lead him to the title game. And then he had a big dip down year in efficiency. And then he transferred out and ended up winning Pac-12 player of the year for Arizona. So could something similar happen with Kugel where he gets back toward his freshman form and you kind of are talking about a similar thing? You know, I, I don't think that's unheard of. So, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say Riley Kugel is a take and would be a nice pickup for KU if they can get him. All right, let's uh, finish up here. KU women's basketball got some player personnel news that in just a moment. This week's March Madness Bracket Highlight is brought to you by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out, a team that's pushed it further than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. 
the NC State Wolfpack. They're obviously this week's Nissan Rogue. This team absolutely surprised us with a powerful performance. Emphasis on the word powerful with DJ Burns down low in their first two games of the tournament. Win over Texas Tech and then Oakland in overtime. Have them play in Marquette in the Sweet 16. And for NC State, seven wins in like a 12-day span. Unbelievable. They say win life, go rogue, and that's exactly what the Wildcats have been able to do so far. Take the Nissan Rogue, Nissan Pathfinder, or Nissan Armada and go find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com. Finishing up with some KU women's basketball news, and that news is that Yvette Mayberry, who's one of the starting guards for KU, has announced she'll be back for her, uh, I guess, COVID season, her extra season, her super senior year next season for KU. This is a big deal because... Kansas was set to lose four starters if Mayberry decided to move on because four seniors around Samaya Nichols. Now, good news for Kansas is arguably their best player was a freshman. You could have arguments there. Tiana Jackson's so important. And, you know, as a guy, Franklin and Holly Kersky are all the career accolades and everything like that. But now you have a, a veteran back mate or uh, backcourt mate for her with Yvette Mayberry. So I think that'll be very huge for KU. I, I believe they're roommates. So, like, you know, that'll be good for, I'm sure, leadership and everything like that. Samaya Nichols takes another step forward. There is a lot that Brandon Schneider is going to have to do, I would imagine, in the transfer portal this offseason because um, KU women's team, just like the men's team, the bench really struggled. There was a big drop off from the starters to the bench. So they're going to have to add some key players. I do think there were some bench players who were young, like uh, Laya Conesa, who was a young player who uh, I think was injured to start the year and then came on a little bit later. And from Spain, like she showed some flashes. I could see her taking a big jump in, in year two as a sophomore and everything. But they're going to have to add some pieces. But that's now a nice nucleus that you have two of five starters back. And you could argue uh, Samaya Nichols maybe next year, you know, year is, is we're talking a Big 12 Player of the Year candidate. If she takes that next step up after we already saw her play at such a dynamic level here in year one. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Locked on Jayhawks. Uh, we were originally going to do an early offseason big targets list. We'll get to that on Monday. Of course, if there's any other players like a Google who narrows down their list, we'll uh, get to some of that stuff as well. This has been Locked on Jayhawks. Make sure you subscribe to the show anywhere you get your podcasts, including on our YouTube page. See you next time with LOJ.